All right, I think it's recording. We are live. So uh, hello, everybody, and happy Friday, and welcome to our March meeting. Um, we've got uh, Mark Alberhaski here tonight. He is going to be not only our, doing our presentation, but he is going to be our uh, guest judge. Uh, so we're doing <coughs> a little bit different this time. Uh, the points are still going to uh, be awarded, but uh, he's going to um, um, announce the winners for us tonight. Now, Kevin, I like your background. So, um, let's see what else we got going on. Let me go ahead and get the slideshow started, I think. We've got a lot of stuff we're going to be uh, discussing tonight, some business stuff. So, give me just a second here. There we go. Okay. Can you see? Can you see the screen? Yeah, I can. Yep, we're good. All right. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> I can't see. Let's see. My remote controls. Okay, that might work. Do it the old-fashioned way. That works. Okay. Uh, everything's working on your end. What I see on my end is different than it was last month, which was different than it was the month before and different than the month before. Uh, one of these days, I'll get, get the hang of this Zoom stuff. <laughs> so anyways, welcome to our March meeting. So we're going to do the usual. We're going to talk business a little bit. We're going to talk about events. Um, we have Mark here to uh, do his presentation and the photo challenge, and we're going to do it a little bit different. He's going to do the photo challenge first and then his uh, presentation, and that's just to help us with the sharing aspect of this. So I was talking about the uh, club dues um, for the new members. We have a uh, um, we have paid members and uh, free membership. Um, the main difference is that paid members get extra benefits. Um, people who have not paid can still go on uh, field trips with us, can still attend the meetings, can still post on uh, Facebook. Uh, but if you do decide to uh, pay the dues, you get some extra benefits. And all the money that we collect through dues go directly to the uh, site and uh, funding for just things like paying for our uh, Zoom uh, subscription and things like that. Um, as I mentioned, we have a new website coming, uh, hopefully be up um, maybe even as early as next week. Uh, Corey has been working on that and he's actually out of town uh, this weekend. So we weren't able to get it up um, before the meeting. And then Lisa's gonna talk about our new um, mentorship program. So this is a screenshot of the homepage of the uh, new website. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the tabs and everything. Um, I think Corey will do a live demo uh, for us uh, next month, but he did a, a, a demo for the uh, board members this past week and everything really looks great. So I'm excited about it. And uh, we're gonna be able to have access to, uh, I think more information easier to find. And then once the uh, website is up, then we'll be starting our uh, mentorship program. And Lisa's kind of heading that. So I'm gonna let you take over, Lisa. Yep, I've been working hard on this for a couple of months. So I'm really yeah. excited to give you a, a sneak peek at this tonight. Um, this is a new uh, benefit for paid members that uh, we'll be rolling out when the website goes live. Um, most of the, or all of the paid members should have received an email about this program this week. So if you haven't seen your email yet, look for it. Um, it has a lot more information than just this one slide has. Um, but this, like I said, is a sneak peek. Um, the mentorship program uh, involves some of our more advanced and skilled members of the club who have um, volunteer to offer their time um, to help and mentor um, some of our new members or members that have been in our club um, for any period of time 
who are either new to photography or been in, they've been in photography for a while, but they would like to learn some new skills or learn to use some new equipment that they might have. Um, so it's an opportunity for our members to reach out to these mentors and um, ask for some help in all of these different areas. We're calling this an opportunity grid. Um, and you can see that it has uh, equipment on it. It has uh, basic photography skills on it, different areas of interest, different um, applications for post-processing. Um, so we're trying to cover a lot of different areas here. And I actually added another area of interest for black and white photography just this week. So it's, it's a grid that we will continue to expand as, um, as different areas of interest um, come up. So um, like uh, Mike said, this will be an area on the new website that members will have access to through, uh, through a password. And they'll be able to go into this grid area and um, I've eliminated the, the names from the grid tonight, but each of these lines has a name associated with it. So you'll be able to kind of pick and choose which mentor you might want to work with. And on the website, each mentor will have um, a photograph, a headshot, a biography, a short biography, so you can learn a little bit about them. Um, they'll have a link to uh, their social media sites. So maybe to their website, so you can look at their photography uh, maybe to their Instagram, so you can learn a little bit more about each mentor um, to decide maybe who you might want to work with. Um, and then there'll be some instructions for how to reach out to the different mentors um, and start to work with them um, for you know what, what you determine between you and the mentor to be the right amount of time for the topic or um, the subject that you wanna cover. Um, and like the slide shows, um, most mentors are willing to meet virtually right now, but a lot of them are willing to get out in the field with you too once, uh, once it becomes safe to do so. So we're really excited about this program and we think it'll be a really good opportunity for a lot of our members. So uh, as soon as the website rolls out, this will be available. So we'll have it, um, once it's available, we'll Posted on Facebook, but only on the members page, mem on the uh, paid members page. Um, we'll send out an email or something to let you know that it's available. And then next month, we'll go over it again um, in the meeting a little bit more detailed. So if you have questions, um, we can get those answered for you. And any questions you have on that, uh, direct those to uh, Lisa. She loves getting emails. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but actually, seriously, Lisa's running this. She's responsible for this. So if you do have questions, Lisa's the one to contact. Lisa's done a great job on this. Really yes, good job. She has put in a ton of work on this. So uh, definitely I hope people will take advantage of it. Thank you. And let me say one more thing. There, There's a link on the page on the website for feedback. So, you know, we'd love to hear any comments that you have, good, bad, otherwise, because we want this to be a, a growing program. And, you know, if we can expand on it, we'd love to. And that feedback is not just for the uh, venture pro uh, program, but anything um, with regards to uh, the club. Because one thing I've always said is that it's not my club. It's not Lisa's club. Um, it's not Herman's club. It's our club. And so we try to direct what we do based on what the members would like to do. So definitely send in your uh, feedback. So we have got uh, two trips coming up. One is tomorrow, the Zoo Atlanta trip. And then in April, um, it's a, uh, I'll call it a trip slash special event, the EarthQuest Birds of Prey. I'll let uh, Dick speak for a moment about trips. I don't know if he knew I was going to throw it to him or not, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you have anything else planned, um, Dick, or if you were working to see if we could get a second uh, date set up for the EarthQuest. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't got anything. Well, let's back up. So tomorrow is this trip at the zoo. We've had some questions, so I need to say this in case people don't understand. Our ticket allows us to enter the zoo between 2 and 2.30, but we must enter as a group. 
You can't just wander in on your own sometime between two and two thirty. We have to all be together and go in together because there's only one ticket and they will count off 21 people. Um, so I specified the starting time of the event as 145 and I sent an email to everybody I hope um, specifying that I will meet them out in front of the gate near the restrooms. And once we're all together, then we'll all go in. Once inside, then everybody's on their own. You can leave whenever you want. And we don't have to stay together as a group. We just have to enter as a group. Um, and unfortunately, tomorrow, I believe we're gonna have a clear sky and a high wind. I don't know what that's gonna do to the animals. Um, but then in April, we have EarthQuest bringing their birds of prey, probably an owl, two hawks, and a condor to the site outside coming where we will get an hour and a half or so, 15, 20 minutes per bird um, to shoot them. And we can then stay around for the sunset if we choose. Um, we have enough interest, I believe, to do a second event with EarthQuest, but I wanna wait and see how this flies, <laughs> pardon the pun, how this works out before I go schedule that next event. Um, the other thing that I would am anxiously trying to get organized, although it depends on Mother Nature, is a wildflower shoot at the Shirley Miller Wildflower Trail out near Villanau, Georgia. Um, beyond that, uh, as Mike alluded to, use the feedback link or message me directly or email me or call me, whatever, if you've got any ideas for what to do. Um, I haven't yet looked to see if the <clears throat> Helen to Atlantic balloon race is going on, but we have done that before as a group. Um, and other than that, I'm open to suggestions. If it's just me making the choice, you'll go where I decide I want to go. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. So I'm, I'm looking for ideas because as Mike said, I want this to be what you, you guys want to do, not just where I decide to go. And if anybody is planning on going somewhere and you want company, feel free to post it on the page and say, hey, I'm going to uh, Anna Ruby Falls. You know, anybody want to meet me there? Uh, one of our biggest trips ended up being, like, we call these impromptu trips. One of our biggest trips was to a brass town ball about five years ago. And mm -hmm. actually somebody posted that morning about the trip. So it was, I mean, it was all organized in one day. Um, Last year, before the pandemic started, uh, Bob Kelly had posted about the uh, um, the Sloss Furnaces in Birmingham, uh, just that he had been there, and it generated a ton of in, um, interest. So we went ahead and uh, created an event to go there, and we went there, I think, uh, yeah, it was in uh, uh, February. Right. So, um, you know, yeah, you, you just got to let us know, and sometimes something that you think is not going to be big a lot of people might be interested in. So, you know, don't be shy on the uh, club pages. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say about the zoo, um, of course we had the, um, um, when Dick was talking about the tickets, those were the uh, uh, group rate tickets that we uh, did online. Um, I know that there might've been a couple of people who bought tickets on their own. And there's actually a couple of people from other clubs who are gonna meet us there they bought their tickets on their own. So um, if you bought tickets on your own, you do need to um, watch uh, the times that you have on there because I know the tickets are timed. But if you want to enter with us, that's at uh, two o'clock. And if, let's see here. If I might add one other comment about going to the zoo. Sure. Uh, if you've got a monopod, it's sure the time to get it out and dust it off and use it with your long lenses. Because you can right. move so much more quickly with a monopod than you can with a tripod. And the, your best results will come from stabilizing it that way and using a faster shutter speed as opposed to thinking, I'm on a tripod, I can shoot slower shutter speeds. Uh, because you don't want that with, with wildlife. They're moving all the time, even when they're not moving. So faster shutter speeds and uh, easy, easy access with a monopod or even use your tripod like a monopod with the legs folded up so that you take up less of a footprint when there's people standing next to you that liable to bump into your equipment. So those yeah. are just some thoughts about stabilization. Yeah, I did, I did, I did 
talk to the zoo people about that and they have no problem with tripods. However, it's a valid point. We need to be courteous and shrink our footprint as much as we can. Yeah. So I agree with the comment. Yeah, we don't know how crowded it's gonna be and you don't want a little kid tripping over your tripod and them getting hurt and then knocking over your, uh, your camera <laughs> and you getting hurt too, or your camera getting hurt. So you, you wanna watch for that. Anyway. All right, so next, um, I can't see who's on right now. So Timmy, are you on? I am, can you hear me? All right, I, yes. can, see your, I can see your name <laughs> and I can hear awesome. you. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, Timmy has arranged our first uh, workshop for the year. I think it's still tentative, but uh, I, um, well, I'll let you talk, you can tell us. <laughs> okay, um, so as far as I know, we are good to go um, April 22nd at 6 p.m. Um, it'll be an hour long approximately workshop um, on night sky photography. Um, it happens to be one of my friends, um, but she's also a professional photographer in Northern Michigan. Um, she's based out of Traverse City, Michigan. Um, and uh, she's a landscape photographer, but her one of her specialties is night sky. Um, so obviously it would be more conducive to an in-person workshop um, but Heather has agreed to um, do it via Zoom, um, you know, giving us tips and tricks and things like that, things that she's learned um, as she's, you know, done it. Um, and uh, if you want to see more of her work, um, it's Snap Happy Gal um, Photography. So I can I can put that in the link, too, if you're interested to kind of see what she does. Uh, maybe that will help you um, determine your interest in the workshop. Um, for, for those of you, uh, for those of us members. Um, but anyway, yeah, April 26th, at, or April 22nd, excuse me, at 6 p.m. Um, via Zoom will be our first workshop. And we'll get that posted um, in the next week or so onto the uh, Facebook page, and it'll go on the website. Um, for uh, the new members, uh, the workshops are uh, free for uh, paid members. Uh, so all information on workshops are only going to be uh, listed on the uh, paid member page. And the new website has a members only section and it'll be listed there also. Um, and uh, we've had a couple other things that we're working on uh, for workshops. We're not ready to announce those yet, but uh, when we are, we'll get them out there and just uh, watch it. We're, we're starting to get moving this year, a slow start of the year, but now things are starting to get moving. So real quick, this is something we started last month. We want to do a quick review of uh, from last month's theme, and which was uh, Bridges, and just have a member who's gonna tell us why he voted for the three pictures that he uh, voted for last month. And that's uh, Rick Olson. So he's gonna quickly tell us um, the theme was Bridges, why he picked the three that he picked. Good evening, folks. So we just heard from Timmy. Um, this is uh, Timmy Schaller's image. It came in third in our contest. It was my second choice actually. And I absolutely love this image. It's a fine composition. Um, the covered bridge um, <clears throat> sitting between, it's nicely framed in between the foreground trees. And I like the vignetting that's been done with it. It's interesting, there's a couple of no exit signs uh, on the front of the thing and there'd be a temptation to clone those out but as I thought about it, they actually draw the eye right toward where you want it to look. And um, I think it'd be missing something if they were if they were removed. Plus they're the brightest thing in the image. So uh, I kind of thought that between those and the sort of diamond shapes that you can see inside the bridge, everything brings your eye right where it should uh, to the entrance of the bridge. Um, I don't think I would change a thing about this image. I absolutely love it. What's next, Mike? All right, there we go, this Travis's. Mike told me I had a total of 30 seconds, so I'm, I'm already over. <laughs> this one was Travis Rhodes. Uh, he came in fourth place last month. Uh, this was my number three pick. Um, <clears throat> and I was gonna say it was similar to the first one, similar to the one you're gonna see last, I guess, in that you have uh, a bridge going from right to left and sort of descending. Um, the difference here, um, Travis's case, you have uh, the subject is sitting up on top of the of the rail, and uh, 
moving from, from right to left and downhill. I like how you have all these leading lines between the bridge itself, uh, the train sort of forms another one, uh, the smoke uh, coming out of the top of the train forms yet another one, and they're all kind of heading off to the lower left. And I think uh, we have sort of a secondary subject over there with that reddish, uh, that reddish tree uh, sort of being an endpoint. Another gorgeous image. I like the colors. They're, um, they get your attention, but they're not overdone. There's nothing blown out about the image. Uh, it's sharp, but it's not gritty. Uh, just really nicely done. And I think it's interesting that the train is moving away from us. That's a little bit unusual for most of the train shots that we see. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Next one. All right. Oops. All right, there we go. Okay, this was my number one pick. It was also the number one pick from the group last month. Everybody loved this image. This is, by the way, London's Millennium Bridge. I had to look that up. And uh, the River Thames and um, uh, that's St. Uh, Paul's Cathedral that's well lit across the, across the water there. Um, the subject is interesting. The bridge itself is, is unusual and it's attractive and has just enough light on the underside of it for us to see all that beautiful detail on the bridge. Um, I think it's kind of interesting that the image is so bluish. It, it, it almost seems like it's an, like an error with uh, the setting of the white balance. And yet I wouldn't want it any other way. This thing looks fantastic with that bluish track. You're, you're fading out, Rick. I'm sorry, I said, can you hear me now? Better. Okay. What I was saying was I, I like there we uh, go. I like that bluish cast. Uh, it, I think it, it could have just been a, a white balance error, and yet it, I wouldn't want it any other way. It looks good with that bluish look to it. Um, and I like the way the leading lines come into that far side. You have just enough light along the shoreline there uh, to see some really good detail, including these these tiny white bulbs that run in a line all the way across from left to right and a very slow shutter that gives you some nice uh, reflections of all that light across the, across the river. Beautifully composed, kind of a rule of thirds, but not really. Uh, and you've got some negative space up at the top that's about one third of the image vertically. Uh, just a great composition, super sharp. I like everything about it. All right. So uh, we probably won't do this next month since Mark is gonna tell us, um, his opinions on the on the pictures this month, but um, we'll continue it in uh, May. So thank you, Rick. Yep. And like I said, we're gonna go a little bit out of order. Um, these are our themes for the year. Um, this month it's Boca. Uh, next month it's gonna be Cityscapes and you can see the others. And like I said, these are all gonna be on the new uh, website so that you can kind of uh, plan ahead. And the uh, rules, uh, one image per person. The image must be less than uh, two years old. Uh, no composites. You must be a paid member. Uh, you need to be present at the meeting um, to, um, to submit your image um, and get points if you win. Uh, but we do allow one miss per year. Some people have already used that. Um, and then something new we're doing this year um, a photographer of the year is going to win $100. Um, I'm not going to go over the voting since we're not going to have voting this month, uh, but we're still going to award the points. And uh, first place gets five points, second place gets four points, and so on. And at the end of the year, the uh, person with the most points will be named the photographer of the year, and they'll win the $100. They'll also get a free uh, membership next year and a uh, pretty uh, spiffy uh, trophy. So, hey Mike, yes. Could, could you throw in a plate of slutty brownies with those prizes? Uh, I'll see if I can convince my wife to uh, make those. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Come uh, on, Mike. You could make a set of brownies. What? You can make brownies. No, 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 no. I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed in the kitchen. I'm only allowed to grill. Ah. <laughs> uh. So, anyway, <laughs> so. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Mark, and what we're going to do is he's going to go through the challenge first, then he's going to um, do his presentation, and after the presentation, he's going to tell us um, his picks for the uh, winners this week. So you have to uh, hang on to the end. 
Uh, but before, first I want to go ahead and introduce Mark. Um, he's a physician who has also been a commercial photographer for 20 years. He has been uh, published in many magazines, uh, commercial installations, calendars, textbooks, medical journals, stock agencies, and private collections. Um, he was also a mentor for the uh, Nikon Mentor Series for over 10 years. So Mark, let me go ahead and let's see if we can get you to share your screen. That means I got to stop sharing my screen. All right, you should be good to go. I can see your screen. Mark, you're muted. That better? There you go. Now yeah, we can hear here you. I am. <laughs> here I am in the flesh. Let me say it's a pleasure to meet all of you and be invited to, uh, gosh, be your first guest judge for the, the weekly contest. I've been doing these for many years and always enjoy doing them. I will preface my comments on uh, a lot of nice images by saying that judging is a very subjective process. And um, so if you think you had a great shot and it doesn't get proper recognition tonight, don't be discouraged. It's just the crazy judge, he, he, he messed up. So no, seriously, there are wonderful images here tonight. Um, and it's always tough as the judge to narrow it down to the few people who get selected for recognition, but there are many nice shots here. And so let's get into them without further ado. All right, we're just gonna go in numerical order. So here's a, a nice floral image. And of course the theme tonight is bokeh and bokeh really is not just a fancy description of narrow depth of field. We all know what narrow depth of field is and you get it by using the widest or close to the widest aperture on your lens so that what's in front of the subject where you're focused and what's behind the subject is, is blurred. And depending on uh, the conditions that you're shooting in, which lens you're using, whether there are point sources of light in the background, you can get incredibly dramatic effects with bokeh. Sometimes you just wanna use it to remove uh, the subject that you want to emphasize from a distracting background. Other times you actually want to use the elements in the background as beautiful backdrop for what you're working with. So as we look at this floral image here, uh, this the particular composition here is close to being a square. We see a background that is, is enough blur that it's hard to tell exactly what it is. Could be a waterfall. It has that sort of white linearity that could be a waterfall. We have some of the green foliage that goes along with the colored blue and we get a hint of the interior of the flower there, some, maybe some pollen uh, on the inter internal structures. So really the comments that I wanna make here are that it's, a, it's an effective use of bokeh. We've isolated the subject. The challenge for me with this photograph is it's of a lovely colored subject and yet to some, to some extent the, the photograph feels a little bit washed out color wise. And so um, that's a little bit of a challenge for me because I'd like to see more punch both to the colors in the bloom and the colors in the green foliage. I like some of the contrast of the foliage elements with the bloom itself, sort of the razor sharpness in some of the leaves and the smoothness of the bloom. But I'm a little challenged by just the architecture of the floral elements and the bloom. Um, and, and I'm left wanting a little bit to see a little bit perhaps the bloom smaller and a little bit more of the surrounding foliage that perhaps if you saw more, there could be a, a more of an aesthetic architectural arrangement of those uh, green parts in relation to the bloom. The next image here is, um, it is a use of bokeh in terms of the blurred background, no question about it. it is an effective use of the concept of bokeh for a background in that the point sources of light are very interesting uh, and have a dynamic character to them. The, the tremendous gradation between brightness and, and darkness throughout the frame. And this would make a great, a stunning background uh, for many shots where there was a foreground subject that was being isolated from this background. The challenge is, 
as a bokeh shot to only have the blurred background um, leaves you wanting for some dramatic subject to, that that is isolated from this blurred background. So I would I would be filing this in my inventory of usable backgrounds when I wanted to do a composite shot, but uh, but as a demonstration of strong use of bokeh without a subject, it's a challenge to, to say that that was successful. So here is a beautiful shot. Um, this is, there's a wonderful palette of dynamic color in the blurred background, all the beautiful greens and the darker uh, anchoring blacks at the top and the bottom of the frame. We have a, a great piece of wood with that kind of pinnacle point going up uh, in the vertical frame. And we have, and, and there's tremendous texture in the wood too, which is interesting. But then we have really fabulous content. I mean, this content in this instance is what really drives this photograph. And um, what we see here is one bird feeding a seed to the other bird. Um, and I presume that these are woodpeckers. And um, it's really fascinating to see the talons of the one bird holding on to the bark uh, and, and the two birds feeding each other. So I like everything about this image. Now, if this were my image, I think I might do something different to it. And if I can get there, let's see. Uh, that's not what I want to do. Okay, run stack. So um, what I suggested trying, so I went ahead and did this. I created a virtual copy because I wanted to see this image as a horizontal instead of a vertical frame because it lets, it, it really all that extra background of all the lovely green is not the main subject of the photograph. The main subject of the photograph is the dynamic interaction of the birds. And by cropping the frame um, horizontally like this, eliminating some of the wood, yes, it does eliminate that interesting pinnacle at the top of the wood, but it really makes the photograph about the birds. And it shows the detail and the plumage of the birds uh, the texture in the bark, the interaction of the beaks and, and what's being exchanged there. So I think both images have merit, but I, I encourage, and I'm not saying that this image is better than the original image but in any way, shape or form. The point of doing this exercise for you is to understand that with the resolution that we have in the current cameras that we're using, there's tremendous content in the images as we zoom in and crop. I used to be a only compose your images and use the full frame guy, but now I understand there are images within images and in the new huge high resolution files that we get from these cameras, there are all sorts of secondary compositions uh, that can be as powerful, if not more powerful than the original photograph you intended to make. And so this is an example where I think really showcasing the birds is what the picture was about. And so now let's go to this next one. So here's a really lovely image. Now, the, the, the reason I like this image so much is the very, very effective use of bokeh in isolating these two locks. These two in particular with the color really makes them just leap off the screen. So with the narrow depth of field, isolating those two locks together and the color pop, it's like a home run image. Then you've got the diagonals at the top of the frame leading you back into the blurred background. Another one in the bottom of the, of the frame that's more vertical here, uh, also effective. Now, the only challenge about this photograph is this part of the frame where it's very empty. So I encourage you, just take your hand as you're looking at the screen, just take your left hand, hold it up to the screen and crop away the part of the frame that's kind of beige and out of focus. So it's really dark fence with those diagonals. And it, to me, it becomes a much more dynamic image that way. Now, what I would do if I'd been on this bridge and I was shooting this shot, I would wait there with my tripod or whatever set up holding this shot in view until a couple comes walking along holding hands in that left side of the frame, a little out of focus. And then all of a sudden, bang, you've got an image about romance on the bridge, about what the locks on the bridge are meant to represent. And it's worth hanging there for five, 10, 30 minutes, whatever you feel like you can invest to take 
this already great composition and image and really rock it into something amazing. So I really like this shot a lot, but I think with patience and a little visual creativity about what could happen if you can even have a couple that's coming along and you can direct them and say, hey guys, do me a favor and hold hands as you walk across this part of the bridge for me. And people will, people will do that. And then you get that image that has the, the extra message. All right, so somebody in this club really rocked it with this image. Um, it's really, really a lovely shot and very creative. And using the crystal ball as an inverted lens like that to capture the blurred Ferris wheel illuminated in the background is absolutely wonderful. And now I think they shot it actually 180 degrees because I think the, the white beams are the legs of the Ferris wheel. So the, uh, they, they inverted it so we could see the Ferris wheel right side up in the crystal ball, if I'm not mistaken. But either way, the hand coming into the screen with the crystal ball uh, and showing the, the sharp image and the beautiful blurred background is really a wonderful, wonderful shot. So kudos to have whoever made this. If I were going to say one thing that I might have experimented with, if this had been me holding the crystal ball, my mind wants to see these white diagonals coming down here and creating this empty junction. That's where I would want to place the ball if it were me. I love the way these diagonals come down and then to feel like this is where things are meant to join, but have the ball up here. I'd shoot it both ways and then see how I feel about it. But that's the place I want the crystal ball in the hand to be. Um, but it's still a very effective shot. And again, kudos to whoever took it. So here's, this is a nice shot. Uh, interesting, you know, sort of porch lantern, sort of uh, glassware a nice um, a range of color tonality coming from the backlighting of the glass. Um, yes, there is effective separation of the subject matter from the blurred background. The challenge for me with this photograph is um, the sort of overcast day or, or snow or whatever's going on in the background creates a really flat condition. So, so the spectral quality of the backlit glass doesn't really have a chance to really get a zing to it that really catches your eye and really makes the image pop. And then so much of the background is bright, featureless, uh, detailless, except for over here where we have some of the tree limbs and a little bit of the tree down here. So it's, it's a challenge for me in terms of the day it was shot on. I think it might be a lot more effective image on a day when uh, there was um, harder light that might make the glass really sparkle and something might be going on in the sky to fill up all that empty white space a little bit differently. Okay, so I don't think anyone can look at a photograph like this and not get a smile on their face. And that's huge because that means you've found content that almost has a universal appeal. And that kind of content content makes images that connect with almost everyone. And also, by the way, become very sellable images because that's calendar material, that's postcard material. Um, it's a great shot. Everybody loves a kitten. The, the, the tentative look of the animal, the little crouch with his paws or her paws, the contrast between the color palette of his fur and the soft green blur in the background, beautifully separated with the depth of field. It's all just great. You know, the, the way the whiskers pop, the, raise, the real sharpness in the eyes, it, it, the, the placement of the head in the field. I, you can just check off all these different check boxes, the diagonals of the wooden beam leading you back to the animal. So it's just a, a, a really beautifully done photograph, lovely. All right, so um, here we have a bird, obviously. Um, I'm ch I'm, it's a, technically, it's a sharp, well-exposed bird. There's a nice catch light in the eye. The beak is razor sharp. The foliage is razor sharp. The challenge for me is I want to see more of this bird and less of the featureless bright background that really wants to pull my eye away from the bird into the frame because that's what bright areas do in photographs. And so I'd really like to, to see 
you know, the, the, the bird's head near the top of the frame or see a more vertical composition if that's how the frame was shot so that I get more of the bird standing on the branch or, or wherever he's standing because obviously the bird is the subject of the photograph. So the more deep, and there's great detail in the bird. So we need to show more of the bird. That's, that's the take home message and less of the featureless background. I mean, I only say, look at this and you see the difference. Here we see the whole bird beautifully illuminated, great uh, perch, even to the V in the middle of the branch that he's standing in with all those talons, uh, a nice little soft catch light in the eye, lovely color palette in the background, nice diagonals. Everything about this shot is great except for one thing. And, and that's just a technical issue. And it may be something as simple as shutter speed um, or um, the quest for maximum bokeh in terms of using a really large aperture just makes the bird a little soft. And when you're showing a, a prey, uh, a bird of prey like this with an incredible beak like that and those all seeing kind of eyes, you want razor sharpness on that face. And so it's just a little bit soft. And for what could have been a magnificent photograph, it's still very good. But if, he if you had that technical sharpness in the image, things like shutter speed really count. Never be afraid with a shot like this where you know you want critical sharpness. Kick that ISO up. Our cameras are so good these days. Higher ISOs are not something to be concerned about. You wanna kick the ISO up so you can get the shutter speed that you need uh, and get the sharpness that you need and shoot and shoot and refocus and shoot and refocus and shoot and refocus because every time you focus with autofocus, you get a slightly different plane of focus. The autofocusing mechanisms are not perfect and they're not flawless. So the more, you know, shoot him, shoot eight frames, 10 frames until a bird flies away almost. Uh, and, and then go back through 20 or 30 or 40 shots and find the razor sharp image. And that's what'll make this image sing. So there's some, some really nice things going on in this photograph. Um, there's, there is good sharpness on the bloom itself. There's lovely symmetry in the petals. Uh, lovely symmetry in the internal composition of the flower, a great thing going on between the, the bright yellow and the green background, a nice kind of vignetting to separate the brighter green surrounding the bloom from the corners of the photograph. So there's a lot that's going on there that's nice. Um, I, I do get a sense of the stem of the flower going down like around at five o'clock. And so that's nice too. The challenge for me is in... in in really being moved by this photograph is that it's when you put your subject pretty much in the center like that, you make the, the photograph a little less interesting by telling this, the, the, the viewer, this is it, this is what I want you to see. And the viewer's brain seems to say right away, okay, I get it, I see it, nice. But then you're ready to go on. Whereas when you begin to move the, the subject almost anywhere else, that's why we all know about the rule of thirds. When you begin to move the subject elsewhere in the frame, it just becomes visually more interesting. So there's that. Another bloom, an insect flying around it, an insect landing on it, um, a lighting situation where you see a beam of light uh, creating shadow on the background and making the bloom glow, maybe backlit somehow with a flash. There's a variety of different things you might try to take this somewhat static image and really make it pop and come alive. All right, so the difference between the last photograph and this photograph, I think you can appreciate from some of the comments I made. This one's a little bit more dynamic because of the brightness of the white and the contrast of the rich yellow in the center portion. And also we have these water droplets. Something as simple as the water droplets reflecting the light raise the caliber of interest. It's still, there still is a little bit of central placement going on here. Uh, and that's, that can be a challenge when you crop it as a, as a square. Uh, I'm surprised how many times when I process an image, put it on my phone. And I like, I like to stretch my image so that it fills the, the full aspect ratio of my cell phone, like on an iPhone, like it's 16 by nine these days or 18.5 by nine or whatever it is in the newer phones. 
And as I stretch an image like that, so I get image all the way to all the edges, sometimes I'm amazed by how much more dynamic the image becomes as the subject gets cropped a little bit and moved off center in the frame. So I encourage you, as you move your images onto your phone, if you're wanting to show the whole image with kind of letterbox black shapes around the edges, try zooming in on that picture because it's probably gonna stay sharp because of the resolution of the cameras that we're often using. And as you begin to make it fill your entire screen, experiment with where you place the subject. And I think you're going to see what I do, that sometimes images really come alive as you become bold, more bold and dynamic about placement of the subjects. OK, so now that we, we come into this image, and really there's suddenly a whole different feel about this image because it's exciting. It's exciting for several different reasons. Even though the bird is relatively central, well, now his head is a little off center, but the, his body is kind of centered, but we've got these three wooden kind of pylons that he's standing on. So they're visually interesting. And then even though we have a lot of negative space, there's some variation in the light intensity with the negative space. So that makes the negative space a little more interesting. But wow, this row of colored lights and the use of bokeh here to turn them into beautiful contrasts of color that, that really play against the black, the relative black and white of the bird and the simple colors that are in the wood pylons. That's what makes the image come to life. And this is, this is a perfect image for what I'm talking about. When you bring it on your phone and you start to stretch this image so those beautiful colored lights go all the way from end to end on your screen, what you're going to begin losing as you zoom that way is some of that empty negative headspace above the bird. And I can almost guarantee you, you're going to feel the energy of what you see on your phone go up and up and up as you take away some of that uh, negative space that doesn't have much going on and you make the colored lights and the bird become bigger and more important on, that, on your phone screen. So give that a try and I think you're going to be rewarded. Okay, when I first looked at this photograph, my first impression was, gosh, it's a little washed out. And I made that comment earlier, but, but now I'm, I'm gonna tell you that very quickly, and this is what happens when, you're, when your visual system uh, acclimates to a photograph as you look at it. My first impression was a little bit washed out. And then within seconds, a whole different feeling came over me. And it was like, wow, the softness of what's going on here, the subtlety of the contrast between the lighting and the shapes and the position in the frame and that pop of white with the main bloom and the pop of gold in the center of the flower, the, all, the way all of this comes together, instead of, instead of my knee-jerk reaction in the first seconds, it went from something where this is just a washed out image to wow, this is something really ethereal and beautiful and soothing. And I want to just keep looking at it. This is an image I'd love to have on my wall. So when I'm stressed out and I walk in my office, this just centers me and calms me down. And so I think this is really a lovely use of the whole spectral range in the background and the composition and, and character of the foreground flowers. Now contrast that with this. This is pow. This is energy, sharpness, bold color, uh, the way the gold, the way the bright yellow behind the dragonfly pops and, and acts like a backlight that, you know, making the wings glow, the sharpness of the animal, the sharpness of his perch. The, the sort of off-center, sort of close to being on rule of thirds that's going on here. The, the palette background with its different shapes and areas of color. It's really, really nicely done. And, and dragonflies are tough to get. You know, even if you're using a long lens, they can be tough to stalk. So this is a really lovely capture. 
Okay, so here's another one. There's good separation of the foreground structure and the background elements, similar to the seagull shot. We've got nice colors uh, from the point light point sources in the background. They're not quite as soft as we saw in that picture. They're a little bit crisper circles. Um, yes, I can appreciate uh, use of the Coca-Cola bottle. And yes, I can make out the uh, sharp graphic, uh, uh, you know, in the glass itself. But I'm, I do struggle a little bit with how um, the background, the backside of the bottle sort of blurs in and competes with the lettering on the front. So that's, that's a little bit of a struggle. And then Somehow the colors that are in the bottle themselves, there's a bit of a there's a bit of a fight between like the greens and the blues um, versus the amber colors that are in the bottle. So it the overall effect for me is not as calming and soothing, perhaps as when I look just, I'd rather almost just see the bottle itself and savor all the tones of that color palette. Uh, than some of the competition with the colors that are in the, the background in this image. Now, here's another lock on a fence uh, shot. And I, I'll, I'll have to leave it to you to remember the angle that we saw of the other fence with the, the, the other two locks uh, and how the very narrow depth of field separated them from other locks on the fence. Here, we're looking straight on the fence and, and, and it's a well-composed shot in, shot in terms of a nicely laid out fence grid, the, the background, uh, a beautiful color palette, nicely blurred point sources of light, um, and, and you know, a very sharp rendering of the single lock. But in terms of the emotional response that I get from this image because of the, um, the flat looking straight onto the fence and only seeing the one lock, it doesn't excite me visually quite the same way that the other locks on fences did. But it's, an, it's a nice shot and I do like the color palette a lot. All right, so here we have an interesting flower. I, I'm, I'm not a great with flowers, but I think it's an orchid, isn't it maybe? I, I believe. Really pretty colors, uh, fascinating textures. Um, again, we've got it cropped in a square and we've got the subject dead center in the square. And I, I always struggle a little bit with that for reasons I've already alluded to. The thing that challenges me the most with this photograph, and I'm not sure exactly how the effect is generated, but the bokeh in the background is so busy and there seems to be such repetition of the circles um, of light in the background that it's so busy and dynamic, it really, even though it's not super bright, pulls my eye away a lot from the central subject. Um, and, and what's going on in the bloom at about four or five o'clock, four o'clock with that one portion of the bloom um, is, is also distracting from the beauty of all the other petals. So between what's going on in the plant itself and, and how busy the background is, this one is a little bit hard for me to look at for a long time. And so um, I, I would think I'd revisit the subject or work on the background so that it was even softer. Sometimes I simulate additional bokeh in the background by duplicating the layer and throwing a Gaussian blower on it to make the background softer and then using a mask just to reveal a sharp, sharp subject. That might help here. Okay, so you know, transformers. Um, it certainly meets all the criteria of use of bokeh, bold colors, sharp su subject, blurred background, uh, color separation. There's lots going on in the photograph. I just have to confess that the subject matter um, doesn't appeal to my <laughs> to my age group. And so I'd, I'd have to say for, you know, my uh, granddaughter growing up, she might think this image rocks, but the subject matter technically well executed, but it's just not exciting for me. All right, this is a lovely nature shot with the with the two birds, and almost amazing in the way their necks uh, 
and create sort of that heart heart shape. The background is nice. Um, the, the foreground could be a little softer, but that's just the nature of depth of field, probably a long lens and isolating the birds at, at whatever aperture you were using also gave you uh, additional sharpness in those foreground branches. Again, that might be something where I'd experiment with putting a little artificial Gaussian blur on those branches, just not to make them go completely out of focus, just to soften them a bit so the birds become relatively sharper. The challenge for me with this image, um, and I, I refer again back to the other lovely image of the bird where there was just, I really wanted to see a little more technical sharpness. When you look at, at, the, at the eye in this bird, for example, there's movement there. The bird is moving and that eye and the head and the beak are just not sharp. This bird in contrast is a lot sharper. So I suspect there may have been adequate shutter speed to hold this bird sharp but not for this guy. And so, gosh, I want so much for, for what's going on there for the two of them to have sharpness in both birds. Sometimes if I'm working both these birds and they haven't changed much, I might find the sharp image of this bird. And, and I know you guys aren't allowing composites, but I would find the sharper image of the second bird and do a composite. So I had the kind of sharpness I wanted for both heads. Here's a, here's a nice shot. It's, it's simple. It doesn't have a wow, knock your socks off color palette range, but the very effective use of bokeh separating the foreground elements, the rounded buds and petals from the background point sources of light uh, is really lovely. And so I think there's some effective stuff going on there, even though we still have a fairly central subject uh, in this vertical frame. I, I think it's nicely done. Oh, and, and here's, here's another shot, another variation I did of the woodpeckers. And the reason I'm showing this is because I did something extra from the, from the original shot I showed you where I cropped it horizontally. I wanted to make the image wide enough. So if I put it on my phone, again, it's gonna fill the screen on my phone. So what I did, and I'm just gonna briefly review it with you here. What I did, I brought this shot into Photoshop. I used, uh, I duplicated a layer. Did I duplicate a layer? I don't even think I had to. I used the, the, uh, the marquee tool to select right about here. And then I selected the whole rest of the frame out to the corner. And then I used you know, Command T to transform. So I could just drag this half of the frame, scale it, distort it so that I may, because it's blurred so beautifully, I could drag it a fairly significant part of the way and stretch out all these shapes. And I did it on this side as well. So I'm left with this really beautiful rule of thirds kind of piece of wood with the birds on it. I've got this dynamic blurred background that goes all the way out to give me this elongated core sort of a pseudo panoramic aspect ratio. And for me, that makes the image really rock. So if I were to see that on my phone or on the screen like this, I really love it. And it's an interesting contrast to what the original frame was. So just take that for what it's worth. And that's it. I believe that's the last shot. Yeah, that should be it. Yep. Some very nice work. Thank you, Mark. And let's go right into your presentation and then we'll go back and uh... I'll select the winners. Cool. So it's about okay. Eight, six, so about 30 or 40 minutes, I guess, for the presentation. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to go ahead and fire this up. And what I want to do tonight, and I'm going to look over here, well, briefly for a second, so you can see me. my son always gives me grief. Dad, your camera angle. I can't, you should be looking at the camera the whole time, but I got to be looking over at the screen. And, and I'm, I am not doing this man of mystery thing on purpose tonight with the dark highlight on me. Uh, I had a highlight, a main light over here, but it was battery driven and I was setting this up all day and then my batteries die right at the beginning of the meeting. So you're having to suffer through with the man of mystery look and I apologize for that. But what I wanna do tonight is share for you uh, my enthusiasm for mobile photography. And I've gotta say that like many of you, as a, as, a, as a serious camera user, as a DSLR camera user for so many years, um, when, uh, when I was asked by Nikon to shoot point and shoot cameras for them, it was like, okay, I'd love to do that for you. And I learned 
you know what, I can make incredible photographs with these small, quote, less serious cameras. And it's all about, it's all about mindset and using them with the same strict artistic criteria that you would use your big, large camera that you consider a serious tool. And developing that mindset then made it much easier for me to start shooting a phone camera seriously too. And so that's, what I, that's gonna be my main emphasis tonight with what I say. I know everyone in this group is already making pictures with their phone, but they may just be making quick little things, you know, when they need something to remind them of what they saw in the store or they need some quick grab, a selfie or who knows what, but they may not, you may all not be making serious photographs with your phone. And that's where I wanna get, that's where I want your new mindset to go. So let's, let's get in here. Um, try it, you'll like it. You may not like it immediately because there may be things you're just not familiar with about it, but let's go down this. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are Star Trek fans, but I remember when, when the Star Trek series was, had the Borg in the theme that one of the quotes was resistance is futile. The more the cameras get better, the more you're going to discover the cameras and the phones, the more you're going to discover, wow, they really are making incredible images. Now that I'm bringing them into Photoshop and working on them, there's really quite surprising. And wow, there are things I can do with the phone camera that I can't even do with my regular camera. So don't try to buck the trend. Just experiment with floating along in the current. And the more you learn about using your phone camera, the better your work is going to become. Yes, it is very different and non-traditional photo capture. Feels different in your hands. Controls are different. Yes, there are some new tricks you're going to have to learn. But if I gave you a brand new camera from a manufacturer you're not familiar with, you wouldn't know where the button was to change the ISO. You wouldn't know where the buttons were uh, to set auto ISO or to make time, ex time exposure things. So I'm going to tell you, when you start using your phone camera, you need to sit down and invest time in really learning where the controls are buried. Because there are very sophisticated controls there. You just have to take the time to learn how to reveal them and how to set them. I'm telling you that the time you invest and the energy you expend will greatly outweigh the sacrifices that you will initially think you'll make by using your phone camera. When I'm in workshops and we're shooting some really interesting subject matter, one of the things I often say to people is, okay, you're done with your DSLR and you're getting ready to walk away. Now take out your phone and shoot a few frames with your phone because you may be really surprised that with the different lenses the phone has, the different aspect ratio the phone captures in, the capability, for example, of an iPhone to shoot a panorama is not like anything you'll ever get with your camera. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that. And so I try to remind myself all the time, before you walk away, pull your phone out and shoot a couple with your phone. And you don't need, you got a new camera and you didn't even go out and buy a new camera. But the caveat is this last one. You may discover that you want to buy a new phone. That's the unexpected one. Change your mindset. It's a tool, okay? It's a tool. Every camera you've ever used is a tool and they all have different settings and it takes time to get used to a new tool. So embrace it. The whole screen is a viewfinder. And in, in dim lighting situations where you've got this illuminated, I don't know how many of you are already shooting mirrorless cameras with electronic viewfinders, but to have a viewfinder that can be that bright, even in low lighting situations can be amazing. And to be able to just tap on the subject you want and have it be sharp focus is pretty cool too. Try, to, try not to think where are the dials and buttons I need. The controls you need are there. You just have to be patient, go and look for them and get comfortable with finding them and accessing them quickly. Don't think, but I can't use Lightroom and Photoshop. Well, in fact, yes, you can. It's easy to export these images onto your computer and use all the tools you're familiar with. And what you're gonna discover is that there are Lightshop and 
<clears throat> Lightroom and Photoshop like applications on your phone that will allow you to do surprisingly powerful editing on your phone in the field. Sometimes you'll be so happy with what you do editing on your phone that you can stop. Other times you might do a little bit in the field and then import that image onto your computer and finish it there, whatever. But in general, just try to avoid thinking of ways why it won't work and start using it because you're going to be surprised and you're going to get rewarded. Choosing the tool, all right? Which platform? Basically, it's Apple versus everything else, Apple versus Android these days. And I can't begin to sell you on one or the other. If you're already an Apple user, you're probably going to have a very strong predilection to staying with Apple. I was a strong Apple user for many years. Then I switched to Android to try it, to see what there was. And I discovered that there was about a two-year period when the Google phone camera was so much superior to what Apple was putting in like their iPhone, you know, 10 and 11, uh, well, may, maybe eight, nine, 10, that the Google phone, I sold my I, I, iPhone and got a Google phone and rocked incredible photographs because the sharpness that was coming out of that camera was, and the shadow detail and everything was unparalleled compared to iPhones. Now, in, in between the 11 Pro Max and the 12 Pro Max, iPhone has gotten their camera game back together. And honestly, the iPhone is so much easier to use. I went back to an iPhone, but that doesn't mean the Androids aren't very capable. And wow, the new Samsung 100 megapixel capture, good grief. I mean, I haven't shot with it yet, but I would sure like to play with it and see. Now, I want to say something about the image that's on the screen right now. This is a green boa. And the reason I want to say something about this image was it was at the Atlanta Zoo in the reptile house. And I walked up and this boa was curled up like that. And what I saw from my camera, I wasn't really excited with. But then I put my Google 3 camera against the glass of the screen and shot this boa with the with the google pixel look at the detail in those scales look at the color i was able to get from the capture and maybe enhance just a little bit the detail i love this image and every time i see it i think and you shot that with a phone through the glass at the zoo it's, it's, I just love this image, okay? How many lenses? So many of the top line phones now have multiple lenses on the back. We're getting ultra wide angles. We're getting, you know, two and three X digitals. I mean, optical zooms now. The quality of the optics has gotten so amazing. Now we're getting night sky that you can shoot night sky stuff and see celestial, uh, you know, points of light with your phone. It's just amazing what's happening. And it's changing so fast, I'm not going to invest a whole lot of time discussing new features because it changes next week, it changes six months from now. You're just going to have to pay attention to the hardware. The one thing I will tell you on is that fourth one. If you're thinking about a new camera because you start to get excited, but you see somebody else's shot and they've got a newer version and, and you skipped a couple of generations and you decided it's time to step up, go to the store with some object or things that you find on the counter and shoot side by side. I mean, go to like one of the, like the Verizon store or the AT&T store where they're gonna have the Apple camera and the uh, Samsung camera side by side. So you can make images and then zoom in, look at the shadow detail, look at how razor sharp the images are. Look when you use portrait modes, how cleanly the, bokeh, the artificial bokeh that gets created is done. So you can get hands-on experience looking at shots of absolutely identical subject matter in the store how the camera feels in your hand, all those kind of things are pretty critical and they're very valuable in helping you decide, especially if you're considering jumping ship and going from one platform to another. Work it in the store. Now, there are hardware nuances that you need to know about, like understand the rear cameras are usually the high resolution cameras and there's a tremendous range these days from like you know, 12 megapixels, 16 megapixels, 40 megapixels, now 100 megapixels that the rear cameras can capture. So there's a lot of difference out there. It's not all apples and apples anymore, uh, no pun intended. 
The selfie cameras that are on the front, they've gotten much better, but understand they're not going to be as sharp and deliver quite the same size files as your rear camera. And so sometimes you might want to shoot the selfie using the rear camera and just shoot blindly, hold the camera out there and shoot a whole bunch of images using the rear camera as a selfie camera. And then when you go through them and you say, wow, I love this one. And oh my gosh, look at the quality from a selfie I made with the rear camera shooting blind, as opposed to what I got with the selfie camera. And I use that just because I could see myself, but the quality is nowhere near the same. Accessory lenses. There are many, many third-party companies that are making accessory telephotos, accessory wide angles, accessory fish eyes. Okay, the image here of this you dragon. If you want to. The, the image of this uh, with the dragonfly is shot with my iPhone with this little Olo clip macro lens on it. And there was something about me approaching the dragonfly with my phone with that macro lens. It let me get the camera an inch away from its head. If I try to get anywhere near like that with a DSLR, he's gone. But there was something about the camera that it didn't spook him. So I shot like 75 frames, not moving the camera as much as possible. And I literally used my finger and walked the plane of focus across the dragonfly's head because the depth of field was so narrow and then I used one of those image stacking software programs to compress 75 images into one to get this amazing depth of field to show what was going on on his eyes like that. But it's all done with a phone, guys. People don't believe it when I show them this and say I shot it with a phone. <clears throat> So here we get to the camera apps, and this is where a lot of the magic happens. Don't just think, I'm just going to use the camera, and gee, some of the images I'm seeing from the camera and the phone are not as anywhere near as exciting as Mark told me. Well, when you start downloading some of the apps, and most of them are not that expensive, and the idea is you'll shoot the, you'll shoot the image well, compose it well, focus where you want, and then you'll bring the image into the first image editing app that you're going to use and the one I recommend is Google Snapseed. Um, somehow I've lost my cursor again, but it's right up there at the top of the highest screen. Snapseed is free. Google gives it away. It's an incredible image processing program. And if you spend time going through all the tools that are in it, you'll be amazed at what you can do with just that one app. That's why it's my go-to app uh, as my first step in, in mobile processing. Uh, there's a lot of other apps with lots and lots of cool features. I'll talk about it, just a couple of them. But you, the idea with mobile processing is you go to the first app that's your baseline processing thing like a Snapseed, and then you save the image back onto your photo roll. So now you've got the original capture and you have a processed one. Then you open the processed image up into a second app that's got some killer feature in it. And you use that killer feature to make now that the image processed even a little bit more beautifully. Sometimes you might go three, four, five. Whenever you see the iPhone competition images and you start reading about the software that the winners who produce these unbelievable photographs with their phone, they've all used five, six, or seven images. None of those are a single image capture processed in one thing. And so they've gone through a whole range of these apps to get these amazing shots. Um, and, and I will absolutely buy an app for one feature because it's a killer feature because the app may only cost three bucks or five bucks. Remember, we all remember when, when we were buying apps for our computers and we'd pay 60 bucks for an app or $100 for a photo app. And now people gripe because an app's not 90 cents or something. Well, you know, spend three bucks and get this app and use it because it just has that one killer feature. Apple in its latest versions is now letting you use an, their built-in camera to shoot raw files. But there are other camera apps. If you don't even have the latest and greatest 12 iPro Max, for example, there are other camera apps that you can buy that will let you shoot DNG raw files on a camera that doesn't do DNG raw capture with the native Apple camera. So you can use another camera app. It's still using the same lens and the same sensor, but now you're using that hardware driven by different software that you've downloaded onto the camera. 
the biggest thing I can say to you is, is just have fun with it. Start out having fun with some of the effects that you can do and some of the new captures you get because this is the camera. You know, we all hear, we all hear always carry a camera, but come on, we don't always have a camera over our shoulder, but you've always got your phone in your pocket. And there are so many opportunities of great shots you will miss unless you pull it out and start shooting it with your phone. And the more you do it, the more you'll see the opportunities. So let's talk about some. Here I'm going into what Snapseed is, and I've really already touched a lot on this. So I just want to talk about the photograph for a second. Here I was, I was up around New Jersey, and there was this outdoor art museum. And I'm, I'm walking through this stand of bamboo, and here's this absolutely gorgeous piece of art that, that in that setting was just magical to me. And bam whipped out my phone, hardly even had to pause a second, shoot it, auto exposure, focusing on that st statue. And it's a gorgeous image. Here's a fun one where I got in the water. I was out with my buddy and his ski boat and I got in the water on a noodle. I'm floating around and the reflections on the water are gorgeous. The sky is great. And so I wanted to do a shot of my buddy sitting on the back of his boat to send to him just as a reminder of what a great day it was. Now, here's where things get kind of fun. The lady sitting on the boat is not this man's wife. It's, his, it's the owner of the boat, his friend's wife. So I decided to play a trick on my friend and, and I hope I won't offend anyone, but I just searched around on the internet and found a different lady to blend into the Photoshop. So I sent this one to my, <laughs> I sent this one to my friend and he's like, whoa, what happened there? Where was she on the boat? And it was just fun. So this is an example of the fun kind of stuff that you might end up doing with a phone picture just because it is fun. Here I am in Central America. I'm down in Costa Rica and, I, and I'm at a butterfly farm where they also happen to have a uh, tree fog habitat. And this is a red-eyed tree frog, not in a pose you typically see the frog in. He's on a piece of glass, and this is what his body looks like stuck to the glass. And so it was just, it was, didn't feel like it was important enough to me that I wanted to shoot it with my camera. But boy, my phone, I just whipped it out and shot a frame. And now it's a great lead-up shot to what's going to come next. I decided after I went there, I wanted to go back and, and really do justice to the red-eyed tree frogs at night. And it's a rainforest environment. So I made arrangements to go back at night and meet the curator um, of this um, butterfly farm. And he said, I'd love to take you down. You know, the red-eyed tree frogs are nocturnal. So you never are gonna see them really in their native behavior unless you come back at night. So we went back at night in the rain and he helped me find this guy. That's the shot I wanted to make with my serious camera. So I've got, a, I've got my tripod set up. I got a macro lens on. I'm lighting him with a ring light. You can see the catch light in his eye. Incredible color, incredible detail, a little incredible bokeh going on there, okay, to say the, to say the least. I love this shot. Now I have to tell you the story. So I'm shooting this guy, but understand that's a brief flash. As soon as that flash goes off, I'm in near total darkness, except the curator has a flashlight and, and his helper has a flashlight. But other than that, we're in total darkness. Well, all of a sudden I'm going to make another shot and the frog is gone. The flash goes off and there's an empty frame. And I'm like, guys, where did the frog go? Where did the frog go? So now the flashlights start going all around the surrounding foliage. And I'm looking around trying to see if I can see him. And all of a sudden, something feels funny about my head. You know, as you turn your head, you can notice the weight of your head. And something felt funny. And so the frog had jumped onto my face. He was stuck on my face. Well, when I realized he was stuck on my face, I put my face in front of my camera lens and just started shooting the flash off, hoping to catch a photograph of what was going on. And the guys were just laughing. They were just laughing because I had a frog stuck. Thank God it wasn't a, a, a poison dart frog. But um, well, all of a sudden he jumps again. Now he's gone again in the darkness. So we're looking around again. We're looking around again. Guess where he went? He went on to my ring light. Now, how can I get rid of this? I've got this gallery and I think you're all seeing the gallery. I'm hoping I can, yeah, 
He jumped onto my ring light. Well, guess what? That's the only camera I had set up to take photographs with. How am I going to get this picture? My iPhone 6S was in my pocket. So I pull it out and I shoot it with the ring light turned on from in the modeling mode. And, and, and one of the guys is holding his flashlight to side light the frog a little bit. I never would have gotten this shot if I hadn't been used to thinking, make the shot with your phone if it's the best camera you've got for the moment. Okay. All right. So now here's a shot that I was made. I made down in the Mercedes Benz up oh, Mercedes Benz Stadium. A photograph of mine was used in this art pop street composition. And so I've been lucky enough to have some of my work on billboards around Atlanta during the past year. So they asked me to go down to the Mercedes Benz station and shoot examples of all these art pieces um, on the digital billboards there. Well, when I got there, I made some shots with my Nikon C7, but it's a, it's a, it's a flat square frame. And before I walked away, I realized I need to make a panorama of this with my iPhone. Well, look at the way the iPhone distorts the subject and wraps it around and gives this incredible spatial feeling. So I got the shot that I really wanted to rock all the artists who were represented here because I used my iPhone in panorama mode. I've got a you know three thousand dollar Nikon mirrorless, but it's my iPhone that made the shot that that was really dynamic. Here I am out in Death Valley, on the way to Death Valley outside Vegas, and this is an outdoor, uh, a very unusual outdoor museum, uh, and this is a fiberglass rendition of the Last Supper. And as you stand there in front of it, and again, use the iPhone to make this panorama, not only did you get the cool background of the mountains and the sky, but I love the way the wooden stage has that same effect of distortion. There's just some exciting things you can do that way. Um, here is a panorama in uh, Cuba of a mosaic artist's front yard. Now, because I was standing further back, I didn't get the same kind of distortion, but look at what a beautiful rendering that is with the sky, with all the clouds and all the detailed color and mosaic work. And I didn't have to stitch any, any, any still frames together to get there. It's just a wonderful tool. Here's a self portrait I did um, with, with the iPhone. I actually had gotten a new soft box for a friend and I was testing it out at home. Pretty, I, excuse my French, I was gonna say pretty crappy, but it was, it's a pretty, underwhelming photograph at this point. But iPhone images have a, lot of have a lot of room in them if you're willing to process them. So I just got a little bit creative and went from this to this. Now look at the sharpness. You know, this is some of the detail enhancing software that's out there. The eyelashes become sharp, the irises become sharp with the lighting darkness and the modeling shading, it becomes a very dynamic portrait. To go from that to that convinces me that if you're willing to be creative with your iPhone images, there's a lot you can do. Here's another headshot I did, razor sharp. I, this is my favorite headshot. It's my bio shot that I'm using these days, made with an iPhone and a softbox. Here's that, here's that one of, one of my images, not shot with a phone, on a bit digital billboard up in Marietta. And when I got there and, and got out and was going to set up my regular camera on a tripod, I saw on, reflected on the roof of my car, the billboard in, in my roof has sort of a glass uh, texture. And I thought, oh my God, this reflection's incredible. That's the shot I want. Could I get up there and make that shot with my camera on a tripod? No but I could lean against the back of the car with my elbows and hold my iPhone really steady and make this incredible shot. So again, it's the iPhone wins out. It's the best camera for the circumstance. And what are you going to do when you're sitting on the floor and your dog comes up and puts his hand feet on your knee and looks at you and the lighting coming through the door that is sandblasted glass is like the ultimate studio lighting on your dog's face. And the only way you're gonna get that is if you pull the camera out of your back pocket and nail him on the spot. That's how, and this is a great shot. Look at the detail in that. 
I think this was with the Google phone, but the point is it was the camera that I had access to and I got a great shot of my dog that I love. Here's a selfie shot with my granddaughter, priceless. Never would have been made if I hadn't pulled out my phone, thrown it into selfie mode fast, knowing that this was gonna look great and snapped off four or five shots while she was still happy. Here's one where I was actually making this presentation earlier uh, last fall. And she walked up and was watching me setting up some equipment and covered her, you know, just put her arms on there and looked at me with those eyes. And I saw the geometry of the arms and her head and just her eyes looking at me, didn't say a word, didn't ask her to pose, just pulled out my phone and got off the shot quickly because you can do that with a phone. And people aren't intimidated when you pull a phone out. And she's used to being around a phone. So beautiful shot of her. Here I am in a restaurant. I saw this glassware lit behind the bar. I said to the bartender, I got to go back behind the bar and shoot these glasses. He thought I was a little nuts, but I wasn't trying to lug a DSLR and a tripod back there. He didn't care if I took my iPhone back there. And I love this panoramic creation that I made. It can even do, here's, here's a beautiful butterfly right out there in my garden. Very detailed stuff. <laughs> here's my kidney stone shot with the Olo Clip macro. Now you know why those freaking kidney stones hurt so much to get out of your body. Look at the shape of them. How can they ever move down through your body and come out without being painful? Crazy stuff. Here is some of the fun stuff. This is when you're at a location and you're just walking around. And you see some neat floral things and you see some neat patterns, but your brain kind of says, you know, that's not cool enough for a serious picture. So you don't stop and shoot it. But when you're walking around with your phone and you just want to say, I just want to sketch some neat images with my phone. So you start saying, well, look, you know, look at how all these fronds are. There's some interesting chaos there. I'm just going to shoot it with my phone. And it turns out to be visually mesmerizing. Or look at these palm fronds. Oh, there's three of them together. And then there's a hole with a whole different kind of pattern in it. That's the old break the pattern rule. I'm going to shoot that with my phone. And so do it, guys. Do it. Here's a neat shot where I shot my buddy Stacy. He was doing fireworks in his front yard. Crummy, uninspiring shot, right? Then there's this other shot where fireworks were going off and things were getting smoky. Crummy, uninspiring shot, right? Until I took the two of them and put them together. And then it was magic. If you can have the vision and you can be making shots with your phone and start working on them and see what you can do with phone images, it'll just wake you up. And then there's fun things on the street right in front of you where you just got to grab it and you don't want to <laughs> crawl up between some guy's legs with a 70 to 200 and a big DSLR. And here I am at a buddy's dinner and I saw this happen across from me from the table and I just had to say, don't move. And in two seconds, I had this really fun keepsake shot that I threw text on and he got a real kick out of it. Here I'm out walking my dog and I had this idea for this dreamscape shot. How would a dog view the world? Well, when dogs dream, there's fire hydrants everywhere. And I put a little fake Polaroid border on it. Here I am walking the beach in Jamaica. This is an iPhone 6S, but it's bright sunny day. If you could see, if you could zoom in and see how sharp the whiskers on that guy's face are, ah, and the color is breathtaking. And the phone was all I had with me. And it's a stunning portrait. Here's Elton John at the concert with the Google phone and one of those new high ISO modes. Yeah, it's a little grainy, but it's also a really, really fun shot. Here's a very unorthodox use to show you how much detail there is in these images. I had a pain in my foot and I knew there was something in my, on the back of my toe that was bothering me. So I took a picture of it in portrait mode and then zoomed in at 100%. And I could see that I'd picked up a little piece of wire after using some steel wool in my workshop and walking through barefoot. You never think about using your phone that way, but it's actually a little portable microscope. Here are some of the apps I use. 
eye watermark lets me put great watermarks on the picture. Retouch is spectacular at taking telephone lines out of pictures. Snapseed, I've already told you, is a wonderful starting place. Metafo gives you um, all sorts of metadata about cell phone images you might have a hard time getting. Uh, Pro camera is one of the nice shots that will let you shoot DNG raw files when you don't have the late, absolutely latest series camera. Now, I want to show you something else that maybe will inspire you a little bit. It's a little bit off the wall, so I'll just preface it with that. But I was walking in New Orleans. I was on one side of the street, and there was this <clears throat> dark skinned lady on the other side of the street. And the light on her was beautiful, and she was dressed a little bit exotic. And uh, she had a head covering on and she had white iPod earphones in her ears and these mirrored sunglasses on. She was leaning back against kind of a cement block wall. She was so into the music she was listening to with her head just kind of rocking back and her body was just swaying that I felt the energy across the street. And I said to my son as we were walking farther away from her, boy, would I love to shoot her portrait. And he's like, yeah, dad, like you'd ever go back and shoot her portrait. Well, that he'd thrown down the gauntlet. So I had to say, okay, I'm gonna go back and shoot her portrait. So I went back and introduced myself, told her she was just rocking the energy across the street and I would love to shoot her portrait. And she was very flattered. And so she started taking off her headphones, taking off her headgear. I said, no, 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 don't do any of that. I want you to stay just like you are. I want you to put the music back on. I want you to get back in the moment. And occasionally, you know, I shot her for three or four minutes with my, I think it was my Google phone again. Uh, and I got this shot. Now, it's, it's a curious shot. I give you that right off the bat. I'm trying to move the gallery image. Anyway, so she's against this cement block wall. She's got these tattoos on her face and those mirrored sunglasses, but I think she's very interesting personality. But, but the background, I hate the block wall. That's the first thing. So I used retouch and selected the seams in the cement block and it's basically content aware fill. So suddenly the seams are gone on both sides of her head. And then I brought it into a program called After Focus. And After Focus just lets you take your finger and draw on the red area and say, I want to keep all that in focus. And then draw using a different tool and say, this is background. I want this all to blur. And then you just say, go. And I end up with this incredible bokeh effect. Now you can see a little bit down in the lower right hand corner where some of the texture remains and even through the right, well, what was her left sunglass lens, you can see some of the texture on the wall. But look at the difference between those. And I also use Snapseed to give her a little bit of glamour glow on her skin. So it removes some of the blemishes. And then I took it into one other app and put a little uh, starburst highlight on the top of that one eyeglass frame. Mm. But to walk back and, and make this street portrait in New Orleans with my phone, I love this shot. I think it's a very fascinating portrait of a very fascinating you know, person on the street in a unique city. So, and it, it was only because I decided I was gonna go for it with my phone. Snapseed, touch, retouch, after focus, Metfo, Metafo, I watermark. Here I am in the movie theater with my granddaughter, looking at her face as she watches Frozen 2, the first movie she ever saw in a theater. No, it's not technically perfect, but the moment is forever. Beautiful beach scene where the light's great, not the same as my, you know, 50 megapixel DSLR. But the moment I remember being there and it still is beautiful to me. Here's a shot on safari. I'm stuck in the safari vehicle as we cross a bridge and I see this Willoughby skull on a pole. I don't have time to take my camera and make it dramatic, but I can grab my phone and make a very cool dramatic shot. So this is what I wanna tell you. There's amazing things around you all the time. You will miss the shot if you're not using your phone to capture them. That's it, guys. Thank you, Mark. I hope I've convinced you. A lot of those are great. Uh, just getting there. Are a lot of comments that are coming through on the chat. People are really enjoying that. Good, good. Does anybody have that any was... uh, 
questions? How did you make the firework one with the two different images? Okay, I, I took the first image of my friend that was really quite seriously dark, and I just made it a lot brighter so that I got more shadow detail that, uh, and, and lighter background that allowed me to see the outlines of his silhouette. And then I, um, I used a different app on my computer called Remask from Topaz that, lets me, that let me select his whole silhouette. Uh, and then I actually had another photograph that I made that showed grass in a yard. Uh, and I used that to create the grass border at the bottom that he was standing on. So now I have his silhouette standing in a, in a black grass border. Uh, and then I just worked on that blurred photograph of the smoky fireworks, um, increasing the contrast, putting a little vibrance in it to make the glow in the a sky a really nice color, uh, increasing the sharpness on the image. And then I just met, you know, since I already had separated the, the body and the grass on one layer, all I had to do was take them both into Photoshop as layers and make a composite. Pardon? Uh, and that's how I rocked it. That's cool. I still didn't hear you. <laughs> Are there any more, more questions? Michael, more questions? Doesn't sound like it. Um... The um, apps that um, that uh, Mark mentioned, the uh, video of this will be put on our YouTube page either tonight or over the weekend. So if you miss that, uh, you can watch the video and uh, and get the names of those apps. I have some of them, and some of them I now want to get. So, so I, 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 I can't I can't emphasize enough that as quick as the camera in your phone is to use. As, as you begin to see action happening in front of you and you anticipate that this is gonna be cool, you can pull your phone out and hit the camera app and be in that viewfinder so fast that you'll begin to capture some of those moments that would be lost. If you, even if you'd had your DSLR there with you, by the time you take off the lens cap and turn it on and bring it up to your eye and make settings or whatever, the moment's gone. You can work so fast with your camera. I, please give it a try. You won't regret it. I'll give you one example, then we'll go on to the uh, winners. This was a couple of years ago at uh, Dukes Creek Falls. And um, I was with a, a friend and before going down the hike trail, I stopped by the restroom. When I came out of the restroom, you have the uh, mountain view of where Mount Yona is, and the sun was just peeking up over the fog. All I had was my cell phone. Took that picture, went back over to the car, got my camera out, went back over there. Five minutes had passed. The moment was gone. There was nothing yep. I could do to replicate that, no matter how much I tried on uh, in Lightroom, I couldn't replicate it. So I was glad that I grabbed that shot. And as the sensors have gotten so much better, the quality of the files, even the JPEGs that come out uh, are really, really quite high quality. And so you can do a lot with them. You can do a lot with them. All right. So well, at this point, and, let's uh, see. I think we're going back, going back to Lightroom. And if I can come up here, uh, I think what I want to do is, how do I get this down? Well, let's see. Nope, don't want to do that. I accidentally hit that. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So now I can come up here and do this. And then I think, so I think I want to open this. No, oh, that didn't work. Hmm. Anyway, okay. So we'll turn on. So the fifth place winner is number three. And you'll have to help me out with who these are, Michael. Number three is Michael Amos. 
I, for, I often forget. It's a beautiful shot. I won't say more about it because I spend a lot of extra time on this one. Um, I love, it's all, for me, it's all about the content and the content was all about the birds. So as lovely as that background is, I want to see less background and more about the interaction between the birds. The fourth place winner are, is the locks. I love the composition of this. Number four or 14? Uh, that's number four, isn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm struggling uh, here with, yes, this is the fourth okay, place. I, I, I want, before we go on, uh, number four was an honorable mention. We, yes. I asked Mark to pick two honorable mentions and that was uh, one of them. Uh, <laughs> and I apologize. That was, that was my, that was my key, keyboard error. I apologize, but it's a lovely shot. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> and number uh, fourth place, number 14, that's uh, Michelle Grabowski. Lovely dragonfly. All right, third place, number third seven. Place, number seven, that's Emmy. Just a darling, darling heartfelt cat, I, a kitten. I just think that's great. Second place. Second place, number five, that's uh, Stephanie Hahn. Beautiful, really creative. Love what you did with it. Just love what you did with it. And guys, I, I got to tell you, it's really, when it, when it gets to separating out five shots from all this work, it's really challenging. It's very subjective. And then first place tonight, this is the shot that just- Number 13, Lima. Keeps me- keeps me coming back. It's so soothing and so ethereal and it just transcends photograph. It, it, it could be one of those shots where you put a caption on it and you put it on your wall to inspire you every day uh, because it just has that sense of beauty. Very, very, very well done. Well, and then the honorable- to All the winners and yes. thank you, Mark. Honorable mentions were the locks. That was Misty and then number 19. Yes. And that was uh, Patrick yeah. Olmstead. Really That's lovely a, nature. We all work. know his naked bear photography. <laughs> yep, nature work. All right. So I, at this point, I will stop the share and give it back to you. All right. I think I have only two or three screens left on my show. Let me get that back up. All right. So our next meeting is going to be on Friday, April 16th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Our presentation is gonna be uh, John uh, Mariana. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with him. Um, he spoke to us about seven years ago. There's only like two or three people in the club now who were there seven years ago, so it'd be good to have him back. Uh, the theme is gonna be, um, or his presentation is to be nature captured and presented. And our photo challenge theme will be cityscapes. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, post the winning photos on the uh, Facebook page after the meeting. Uh, when the recording is done, I'll get that on to the uh, Facebook page. That might not be until uh, tomorrow night. It just depends how long it takes. And I think that's it. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. I thought it was a great meeting. Thank you, Mark. Ah, thank you very much. I enjoyed looking at your work. I enjoyed meeting all of you, even if remotely. And thank you so much for your kind comments. It's thank a pleasure. You, nice job. Yeah, thank Mark, you. if you have a minute, go through the chat. And uh, I, I just, <laughs> I just did, and I'm very flattered. Thanks so much. I haven't even had a chance to look at them all yet. I might keep this running for an extra minute. But that's it. Um, I'll see a lot of you uh, tomorrow at the uh, zoo, and uh, look forward to. Uh, next month and everybody have a good night thank have a great you. time on zoo bye. Have, a great, have a great time on zoofari thank you bye. Says we're all gonna be out there with our cell phones <laughs> <laughs> well some places you should be using your cell phone okay take care guys thank you thanks